So long, Most High Christ, bless him. Officer Zariah, IUIC, Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, got another class today. I'll praise to the Most High. Lord, will we be edified by the end of it? Today's class is called Psalms 51. King David's example, a classic example of repentance, according to the scriptures and what that looks like for us and how we can apply that, how we should apply that to our lives. All right. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into it. Class, first thing I want to do, let's look up the word repentance. Can we do that? Let's look up the word repentance and just put the definition on the screen. What is that? Because we've heard times before, um, you know, it just means, you know, stop, you know. You're doing wrong. You ask, if, ask for, for, to repent means to simply ask for forgiveness. That's one of the definitions that I've heard. But there's a little bit more to that, right? And let's look at what the definition is, and then let's look at how we do that biblically. Biblically, excuse me. The definition of repentance. Let's read that. The definition of repentance. The action of repenting. Sincere regret or remorse. Said the action, the action, the action. Give me a scripture. You know what I want? It's because it said the action of repenting, sincere regret or remorse. In First Samuel chapter two, because I like this, I already like the definition. It says it's the action of repenting. So in repentance, there's some action that got to take place, right? Watch this. First Samuel chapter two and verse three. Read that. Yes, sir. The book of First Samuel chapter two. And verse three, talk no more so exceeding proudly. Mm -hmm. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. Read. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. What's weighed by God? By him actions are weighed. So actions are weighed by God. We have to take the steps to repentance further than just the asking for forgiveness. Because a lot of us ask for forgiveness and never change. We never take those actionable steps to get to the point where we can be better in the eyesight of our God. And that's what this class is about today. Let's read that definition of repentance one more time. Taking action. Repentance. The action of repenting, sincere regret or remorse. Let's get some of them similar words. So it's sincere. There's some sincerity. Or a degree or level of sincerity that has to be involved in repentance. That means you got to be for real about it. Don't come up crying, talking about what you did three day or three day of a Thomas ago, three years ago, and now you find it saying something. Are you really sincere in your regret or remorse, or is it just because things have now become inconvenient for you, which has brought you to this point? Things we got to think about. Read them similar words. Yes, sir. Similar. Remorse. Con contr contrition. Contr contrition, yep. Contriteness. Contriteness. That's, we're actually going to read one of those words today, I think. Contrite. Come on. Penitence. Sorrow. Sorrowfulness. Regret. Ruthfulness. Remorsefulness. Pangs of conscience. Prick prickings of conscience. Shame, guilt, self-reproach, self-condemnation. Okay. Comp all praises. All praises to the most high. So we get it. We kind of, we get it. We see it, right? Sorrow, sorrowfulness. All these things are the steps to repentance, right? These are the characteristics or the uh, attributes one has to have before we actually get to that step of actually changing, right? He said, he used the word sorrow or sorrowfulness, right? Let's go to that. Let's get on um, 2 Corinthians 7 and 10. And then we'll move forward. 2 Corinthians 7 and 10. Read that for me. The book of 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10. Mm -hmm. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. You see that? It say, for godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. So you see that? Repentance comes from being sorrowful, actually having real remorse for what you've done. Not just because now that it neg negatively affects you and it's finally getting to you and you're trying to find a way around actually repenting. Are we really changing when we say sorry or when we apologize, right? Are we do we really mean that? That's the level that we got to get to. 
You understand that? It has to take some type of hold, a real effect on you to where you realize like, dang, I really messed up. I need to fix this. I need to fix this with my God first and foremost. And if there are things that strain relationships, I need to fix this with my brother. I need to fix this with my sister. I need to fix this with my spouse. So on and so forth. Right? So let's go. Let's get the definition of repentance now according to the Bible. Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 30. The book of Ezekiel, chapter 18 and verse 30. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his ways, saith the Lord God. Read. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions. What did he say? Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions. So that's it right there. God says repent and or then turn from all your transgressions. That's what repentance is, to turn away from our transgressions. What are, tra what are transgressions? Let's get uh let's get first John. Let's get that first. First John chapter three. Three. We're talking about transgression. The book of First John, chapter three and verse four. Mm -hmm. Whosoever committed sin. Uh huh. Transgresseth also the law. What happens when we transgress? What are we doing? Whosoever or when we sin, rather? Transgresseth also the law. So the scriptures in Ezekiel 18 says, in order for us to repent, we must turn from our transgressions. Meaning what? Turn from our sin. Turn from those things that cause us to break God's law. Read. For sin is the transgression of the law. That's what sin is. Sin is the transgression of the law. So when we really look at what repentance is, it's coming back to keeping God's commandments. Somebody say that for the Christian out there that don't believe you got to keep God's laws. They're still running around talking about the laws done away in Christ Jesus. You covered in the blood. No, you're going to be covered in blood when Christ come back if you don't repent. Side note, sidebar. Read that one more time. Yes, sir. First John chapter three and verse four. Uh -huh. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. They say sin is the transgression of the law. Go to Psalms chapter thirty-eight. Let's read verse seventeen. Watch this. Because we're talking about repentance, godly sorrow, the actions. That it takes to get to that point and actually repent before our God. Read that. Psalms chapter 38 and verse 17. Uh -huh. For I am ready to halt and my sorrow is continually before me. You say I am ready to halt and my sorrow is continually, 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 excuse me, before me. Read. For I will declare mine iniquity. I will declare mine iniquity in what? I will be sorrow for my sins. Read that one more time. What did it say? For I will declare my iniquity. Uh -huh. I will be sorry for my sin. I will be sorry for my sin. That's repentance. That's godly sorrow working for repentance. You have to be sorry for something. What is it? Your sin. The things that you have done that go against God's commandments. That's what leads to repentance. Real repentance. You understand that? So let's go back to Ezekiel 18. This is the level that we got to get to. Really being sorry for the actions that we have taken that got us to these uh, these points of a, a lower state. Really being sorrowful, right, for whatever has come as a consequence to our actions, our sin. Read Exodus, not Exodus, excuse me, <laughs> Ezekiel 18, 30, one more time. Yes, sir. The book of Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 30. Read. Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel. So God says he's going to judge us. Read. Everyone according to his ways. According to what? According to his ways. According to our ways. That's what God going to judge us by. That's what he's looking at. He ain't looking at the lip service. He ain't looking about what you're saying, so to speak. Confession is one thing, but what are the actions after that? What do you do after that to get you to that point of, all right, God can now see that I've repented. I can now make those changes or I've made those changes in my life to get me to that point. Right. That's what God looking at. God looking at what we do. Our actions. Read. Say of the Lord. The say of the Lord God. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions. Turn from your, your sin when you repent. Read. 
So iniquity shall not be your sin. So shall not be your ruin. Read that one more time. So what? So iniquity shall not be your ruin. So iniquity shall not be your ruin. Yes, we are ruined in our sin. The scriptures talk about we pine away in our sin, right? The whole, give, me, give me Isaiah chapter 1 real quick. Hold that what you got. Let's look at a level of ruin that comes from sin. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1. Let's read verse. Let's start at verse 4. Yes, sir. The book of Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 4. Uh-huh. Ah, sinful, na sinful nation. Sinful nation. Read. A people laden with iniquity. A people laden, covered with iniquity, covered in transgressions. That's us. That's the Israelites. Read. A seed of evildoers. Uh-huh. Children that are corruptors. Read. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel to, unto anger. They are gone away backward. Come on. Why should ye be stricken anymore? Ye, ye will revolt more and more. Uh-huh. The whole head is sick. And the whole heart is faint. It say the whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. That's us as a people. That's the level of ruin that we can get to, that we have gotten to because of our sin. And guess what? Although this is a nation, kind of covers the entirety of the nation, it's the same thing that happens with us. Our spirit destroyed. We destroy the spirits of those around us. Like in the case of, we'll just, we'll just say adultery, right? This ain't an adultery class, but it's kind of funny that this is part of King David's sin. And we'll look at it. Right. But think about what adultery does. Think about how that affects it. more lives than just the person that that, that commits the sin. Adultery affects the husband. It affects the wife. It affects the children. It affects the body because now you got to remove people that may have just been or played a very important part or a significant role in what's going on in the body. And now they got to be plucked out. Ruin comes from sin. You understand that? So far, so far, so to say we get babies born out of wedlock, outside of marriage, diseases coming into play. That's ruin that comes from sin. And ultimately, the end all be all ruin is you not getting the kingdom of heaven because of the sin that you're in. Hey, before you read that, read verse 6 in Isaiah. I just like that part. Yes, sir. Isaiah 1 and 1. It say the whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. Your heart, your mind. Think about that. Think about your spirit. Your spirit becomes to wax weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. And you can hide it on the outside. You can pretend uh, like you, we righteous all day long. You got your fringes and your boredom of blue on. Your hair wrap touched the ceiling if you a sister. Meanwhile, there's adultery in there. There's fornication in there. There's lying in there. Secret sin in there. You see what I'm saying? That we have not truly repented for. Read verse 6. Isaiah 1. Yes, sir. The book of Isaiah, chapter 1 and verse 6. Mm -hmm. From the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness in it. No soundness in it. There's no soundness in the nation of Israel. And if you look at it at the, at to an individual point, it's the same thing. We go into our sin. Our mind is plagued with that sin. And now we begin to wax weaker and weaker in spirit. And guess what? That flesh started to do. That flesh started to get stronger and stronger and stronger. Now you're watching all type of porn. You was just looking at twerk videos. Now you're watching a uh, guy on girl. Now you're watching regular porn. And that guy on girl turned the girl on girl because you like, well, if I watch guys, that's gay. Let me watch two girls. Is that not still sin? Satan will get in your head and, head and flip that on. You just seen all the girl on girl, all the different races, all the ethnicities, all the nationalities and everything. And guess what you still end up winding up doing? You're looking at man on man now. Read that one more time, verse 6. Yes, sir. From the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness in it. Ain't no soundness in it, Read. But wounds and bruises mm -hmm. and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. So that's what, that's what we look like in the eyesight of God when we in our sin as a nation and as individuals can we get like a picture of like some zombies or something every time i read this for some reason i always think about like the walking dead because they had like those those open wounds on them they bleeding uh arm hanging off it's crazy right can we get something like that walking dead just pull that up we got time i just want to see it you can keep scrolling if you got some more cues scroll look at that thing look at that that's us on the inside in our sin dead 
the walking dead. Read Proverbs 21, 16. You can put some more up there if you see it. Because remember, it said from the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no sound as in it, but wounds and bruises. The putrefying sores, that thing that open up, it started to smell now. You smell like you dead. Imagine what imagine if people could see what your spirit really looked like on the inside. What would they see? What would they see? Would they see that? We yeah, pull that up. Pull that up right there. Really think about it. Proverbs 21, 16. Read that while that's still up there. You ain't even got to put it down. Just read Proverbs 21, 16. Yes, sir. Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 16. The man that wandereth out of the way of understanding. The man that wandereth, or the woman that wandereth out of the way of understanding, out of God's commandments, read. Shall remain in the congregation of the dead. The congregation of the what? Of the dead. The congregation of the dead. With those putrefying sores and wounds all over your body. You like a zombie out here walking around. We have to get to a point or a level of repentance where God contains that into a man or a woman of God. And we're gonna talk about how we do that. So let's give it, let's get back into it. Let's go back to Ezekiel chapter 18. And try to run it from here. Ezekiel 18, verse 30, one more time. The book, the book of Ezekiel. Chapter 18 and verse 30. Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, mm -hmm. every one according to his ways. Read. Say of the Lord God, uh -huh. repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions. Mm -hmm. So iniquity shall not be your ruin. So that's what we got to get to, repenting so that iniquity does not become our ruin or our downfall. You understand? Keep reading. Cast away from you all your transgressions. They say, cast away from you all your transgressions. That's what we got to do. That's the point or the level that we got to get to. We got to take our sins and we got to put those to the side. Matter of fact, Hebrew 12 and 1. Hold that what you got. Hebrew chapter 12 and 1. Cast away from you all your transgressions. Come on. Hebrews 12 and 1. The book of Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. Uh-huh. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with such great a cloud of witnesses, uh -huh. let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Read that one more time. Let us lay aside what? Let us lay aside every weight uh -huh. and the sin which doth, which doth so easily beset us. They say let us lay aside every weight and the sin, the sin, the sin, the transgression which doth easily beset us. It throw us off. It throw us off our game. Imagine working on repentance. We in here. We strong. We find out about the truth. We learn Deuteronomy 28. We learn that's talking about us. We get in here and we fight, but things get harder. Coming to the Sabbath begins to become redundant to you. Coming to the feast days becomes redundant to you, mundane to you. Being around, just being in the mix of brethren, being in the midst of leadership, that becomes something that, you know, you really don't hold in high regard anymore. Guess what you've done? You've opened the door for Satan, and you've picked up all of those weights that have been besetting you, your sin. You start to pick that back up because you got to put it to the side to be around the leadership. You got to put it to the side to be in the school. But our problem is we go back outside when it's all over with it, pick it back up and take it with us. And now we're at home 2 and 3 and 4 o'clock in the morning knowing we got to get up. In a couple of hours, and we watch it, we stuck on porn. We stuck in somebody's DMs. We uh, uh, late at night, knowing we got to go to work in the morning. We on FaceTime having phone sex. The list goes on and on and on. So read that one more time. Yes, sir. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with such great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. So we got to lay those things aside, y'all. Come on. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. We got to run with patience the race that is set before us. We are patient saints. This is all a part of that, being able to lay down our sins, lay those things down, and not just lay them down, but cast them away from us. Go back to Ezekiel 18, 31. Yes, sir. The book of Ezekiel, chapter 18 and verse 31. Come on. Cast away from you all your transgressions, uh -huh. whereby ye have transgressed. And make you a new heart 
and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? So that's what God wants us to do. When we cast away our transgressions, guess what we do? We make ourselves a new heart, a new mind. We change. Read. It says, for why will ye die, O house of Israel? Because what? We die when we don't take those steps. We die on the inside. We die spiritually. And at the end of it all, the second death is what we get if we never change in this life. Because obviously everybody going to die. You can die of old age. But imagine dying of old age in your sin. What you think, on, what you think is next for you? Mm. Let's see. Keep reading. For I, for I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. He said, turn yourselves and live ye. That's what God wants us to do. God is calls, calling us to live in him and not in Christ. You understand? God is calling us to be awakened, to be quickened, changed, made alive in Christ. Through the spirit, through the words written in the Bible. That's what we use to change us. Proverbs 7 and 2. I'm sorry, y'all. We're going to get into Psalm 51. I just, we just got to do this like this. Proverbs chapter 7, verse 2. Yes, sir. God say he wants us to live, right? He has no pleasure in him that dieth. What you good for? You ain't good for nothing. You ain't good for the bringing forth for the kingdom of uh, the kingdom of God. You ain't good for the bringing forth for the kingdom of Christ on this earth. Subduing these nations. Getting this thing back in check. Rulership on earth. But in order to get to that point or get to that reward, right, we got to start somewhere. That is repentance. So read that what you got, Proverbs 7 and 2. How do we live? The book of Proverbs chapter 7 and verse 2. Keep my commandments and live. And my law as the apple of thine eye. It's that simple, y'all. Keep the commandments and live. It's that easy. Somebody tell a Christian you got to keep the commandments. Somebody tell them that. Because I know they got the little green Bible with Psalms, Proverbs, and the New Testament in it. Yeah, that's in there. Proverbs 72 say what? Read it one more time. Keep my commandments and live. And my law as the apple of thine eye. Oh, wow. <laughs> say keep my commandments and live. And my law as the apple. Of thine eye. That's some good stuff right there. That's what repentance is about. Learning that. Because we ain't never learned that in the Christian church. We the, if we had all still been, especially those of us that's in the truth, calling ourselves, keeping God's commandments, trying to repent, Israelites. That's what we need right there. That's that life. That's that living water right there. You understand? This is the opportunity that Christ has given us to repent for all the things that we could have been put to death for. So now, Let's get into it. Let's go ahead and go ahead and uh, look at Psalms 51. Psalms chapter 51 and verse 1. This should be our prayer. Psalms 51. Uh, if you got the type of Bible I got, at the, right at the top of it, it says David's prayer for remission of sins. That's what we all want. That is what we all so desperately need in these last days. Because remember, it say, the scriptures say the righteous shall scarcely be saved. Scarce, that means barely. So it's a level that we got to get to to be ready for that point. Because we may just not make it. Lord willing, he have mercy on us. But let's start here. Let's not leave it to chance. Let's start with repentance. What does that look like? Psalms 51 and 1. The book of Psalms, chapter 51 and verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, mm -hmm. according to thy loving kindness. According unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. So that's what we want, right? King David says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Blot out my transgressions. What are King David's or what were his transgressions? The mighty King David. Second Samuel. Let's look at it. Second Samuel chapter 11 and verse 1. He's asking God for the blotting out or the remission of his sins, right? What were those sins specifically? 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. The book of 2 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 1. And it came to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings go forth to battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged 
Rabbah. And, but David Terry till, still at Jerusalem. And it came to pass in the evening tide that David arose from off his bed and walking upon the roof of the king's house and from the roof he saw a woman washing herself. And the woman was very beautiful to look upon. Uh-oh. So what are what we, what we getting at? Uh, I, we see King David, right? And from his rooftop, he sees a woman, very beautiful to look upon, washing herself. She washing herself. You know she ain't got no clothes on, right? Soap and water, and she got a dress on and a head wrap on. Okay. Keep reading. And David sent and inquired after the woman. And one said, is not this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So this is Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Come on. And David sent messengers and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she, it was, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. Mm, read. And the woman conceived. And she and sent and told David and said, I am with child. So you see what happens when sin get on you? Sin can put you in a position of doing everything that go against everything that you stand for, everything that you believe in, everything that you fought for. King David built his kingdom around God's commandments. But in a, in a, in a moment of weakness, I would say, to his sin, he fell by that thing. I'm going to show you something. Go to Sirach chapter 9, verse 1. For the brothers that deal with that adulterous spirit. Maybe you ain't did it yet, but you're watching porn every night. Your wife piss you off and you run in the room. What you doing? And this is by no way absolves the woman. But what I'm saying is this. Proverbs chapter, Sirach chapter 9, verse, let's start at verse... <laughs> Let me get to this. So Rock chapter 9 and verse 5. That's it. Yes, sir. The book of Sirach chapter 9 and verse 5. Mm -hmm. Gaze not on a maid. What happened? What did it say? Gaze not on a maid. Wasn't that what King David doing? Wasn't that what he was doing? He was gazing on Bathsheba, right? Because he's seen her washing herself. What did scripture say? Gaze not on a maid. Uh-huh. That thou fall not by those things that are precious in her. You know what happened to him? Because he was gazing, he fell by those things that were precious in her. Meaning what? Her body. That thing that's supposed to be covered up, that's why it's precious. That's why our sisters are to dress modestly. What you got ain't for everybody to be seeing. Because what happens? Read that one more time. Gaze not on a maid. That thou fall not by those things which are precious in her. You cause people to fall. You cause a, dr a drastic shift in the atmosphere when you get to commit adultery. Or you put yourself in a position, rather, to open yourself up to ad adultery. You get to gaze and look, and I guarantee you, do it too long. Say, got you. That's why you gaze in the first place. You need to just look. Look at that word gaze. Matter of fact, can we pull the definition of the word gaze? Then we'll go back to second, uh, second Samuel. Read that. Yes, sir. The definition of gaze. Look steadily and intently, especially in admiration, surprise, or thought. Look at that. <laughs> it say look steadily and intently. I mean, you're doing this on purpose. You ain't just so happen to see it and turn your head. No, you seen it and you stayed watching. You kept watching. With the intent to do what? What you gazing at a, at, a, at a woman and the things that are precious in her for, for? What are you gazing at the naked body of a woman for? Go to Matthew 5. Let's see. Matthew 5, 27. The book of Matthew, chapter 5 and verse 27. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Read that one more time. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 27. Mm -hmm. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time. Read. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not commit adultery. That's always been the law, according to God. Read. 
Sir. Watch what Christ say. Watch how he magnifies that thing. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her have committed adultery with her already in his heart. So looking on a woman to lust after her or gazing on her, looking with that intent, guess what you've done already before you even touch her? You've committed adultery in your heart, in your mind, right? This class ain't even supposed to be about adultery, but for some reason, that's that's going around. That's the, the for some reason that's the thing that keep popping up. That's the one thing that Israel just cannot seem to get over: adultery, fornication, lust, porn, phone sex, backdoor marriage, all these different things that's causing ruin amongst us. Well, let's look at King David's example. What did it do for him? Let's see if we can build off that, right? Go to uh, Psalms, go back to uh, matter of fact, now go back to Second Samuel chapter eleven. Let's read verse 4 and 5. Yes, sir. The book of 2 Samuel, chapter 11 and verse 4. Mm -hmm. And David sent messages and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness. And do realize she was in full, full awareness of what was going on. She consented to this thing. This is not a situation where you say he took her. This ain't, uh, give me Deuteronomy 2 and 2 and 5. We might not get through that. Dude, around 22 and 25. This, when it says he took her, this ain't this. This ain't this. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 22 and verse 25. Mm -hmm. But if a man fi find a betrothed damsel in the field, uh -huh. and the man force her and lie with her, then, then the man only that lay with her shall die. Uh -huh. But unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing. There is in the damsel no sin worthy of death. For as when a man rises against his neighbor and slayeth him, even so is this matter. So that's an example of rape, right? That's what, that's what we just read. 2 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 4 is not that. Go back to 2 second, second Samuel chapter 11 verse 4. Yes, she was full of whatever. Guess what? She knew she had a husband too. Just like everybody else did, she knew she had a husband out there. Husband at war. Husband putting in work for the kingdom, for the nation. And she got the nerve to commit adultery. Now, mind, mind you, this is the king, by the way. You think she was going to turn him down? With that little uh, sound bite, that little white boy? Uh, bullshit. <laughs> okay, keep playing. Think you so righteous and holier than thou. Think you cannot be, keep thinking that you're not subject to this. Or keep thinking if you have done these things, you won't be found out. Let's repent, y'all. Let's get it together. 2 Samuel 11 and 4. The book of 2 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 4. Uh -huh. And David sent messages and took her, and she came in unto him, and he lay with her, uh -huh. for she was purified she from her. She came in unto him. She could have said, you know what? I ain't coming up there, but she wasn't going to do that. That's King David. On King David. Read. For she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. Uh -huh. And the woman conceived. And sent and told David and said, I am with child. So not only do they commit adultery one with each other, now she pregnant. You see how he's beginning to fall and things are a domino effect. Stuff starts to happen now that King David is in his sin. Go to this real quick. Go to Sirach chapter 23 and verse 21. Because we got to really examine the level of punishment that we should have received for the things that we've done uh, to this degree, to this nature, we've all been in this particular situation before or something to, to that degree, right? Something to that extent. Some like it. Yeah, so I, yeah, you committed adultery. You committed fornication. You didn't watch porn. You didn't did that. I'm sure of it. And if you haven't, there's sins out there. There's, we've all been in sin. There's nobody that can say they have not sinned. See what I'm saying? But just for this particular point, right, adultery, Bringing in seed by another man that's not your husband. Read that verse. Sirach chapter 23. Let's read verse 21. Yes, sir. Sirach chapter 23, verse 21. This man shall be punished in the streets of the city. So this man is an adulterous man. This man is a, an adulterer. As you read up, he's a whoremonger, right? And he does not fear the eyes of God. He only fears the eyes of man. And that's where we fall in line at. We ain't fearing God. We think we fear God. We pretend like we fear God, but the whole time, knowing God watching us, we having phone sex. We watching porn. 
angels in the room like this, they just bam. You write this down. Send this up. Let's go ahead and send this back up. Write this report. The book of his life, her life. Look what she doing. Look what he doing. It's a sad situation. Dang. I thought he was repenting. They was just watching the class earlier about the same thing that they was doing, that they doing now. Read that one more time. Yes, sir. This man shall be punished in the streets of the city, and where he suspected not, he shall be taken. So that's the level that we have to understand that we should all be punished on, or should have been, rather, for doing what we was doing. We should have been punished for these acts. Read. As the man, and what about the woman? What about the wife? Read. Thus shall it go also with the wife that leaveth her husband mm -hmm. and bringeth in an heir, an heir by another. Ain't that what Bathsheba did? Read it one more time. Thus shall it go also with the wife that leaveth her husband and bringeth in an heir by another. So she got to be punished too. Read. For first she shall disobey the law. Read it one more time. Yes, sir. Take For time. Yes, sir. For first, she have disobeyed the law of the Most High. And secondly, she have trespassed against her own husband. And thirdly, she have played the whore in adultery and brought children by another man. So she didn't jacked up. She didn't messed up three times. See this domino effect? Remember, just iniquity will be our ruin. We got to repent so iniquity or transgression will not be our ruin. This ruin right here. You have set yourself up for failure when you go into adultery, especially as a woman. Because what it say, verse 23, it said, first, you disobeyed the law of the Most High. That's, that's first and foremost anyway. You broke God's commandments. Secondly, you trespassed against your own husband. You forgot, you said to hell with reverence in your Lord. And then what? And thirdly, on top of that, you played the whore in adultery and brought in children by another man. That's a sad situation. We fall by these things in our flesh. We allow sin to reign and rule over us. This is what we get. Imminent destruction. Go to Romans 6 real quick. We're going to come back to this. Romans chapter 6. Six and verse 12. The book of Romans, chapter 6 and verse 12. Mm -hmm. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body. You say, let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body. When you go off into adultery, when you up at night watching porn all night long or doing whatever you're doing, you lying, you back, but it don't matter what it is. But since we're just talking about adultery, when this, when this is going on, do understand your sin has now begun to reign in your mortal body. It's ruling you. And you don't even realize it. I mean, you don't see Satan, but he's there. You don't see the demon, but best believe he's there, or they are there. Keep reading. That ye should obey it in the lust thereof. How do you know that you're being controlled by your sin? Because what? You obey it in the lust thereof. Not only do you have the thought, you act on the thought. You ain't doing that by yourself. You are being controlled. Key read verse 13. Yes, sir. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, mm -hmm. but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. Yield your, don't yield your members unto sin, adultery, fornication, drug use, overindulgence in alcohol, but what? As those but, that are? As those that are alive from the as dead. As those that are alive from the dead. Remember, God said he, he would rather us do what? Live. Keep his commandments and do what? Live. This is the opportunity that we now have under Christ, that grace that we've been given, that opportunity to live, change. You understand that? Be reborn, re resurrected in the image of Christ. Spiritually, of course. And one day, Lord willing, yes, real power. But we'll never get that if we don't start here. Read that one more time. Verse 13, we're going to go back to Sirach. Yes, sir. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, mm -hmm. 
but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. Uh -huh. And your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So no longer are we using our bodies for sin. We're using our bodies for righteousness unto God. Verse 14. Yes, sir. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. You say you are not under the law, but under grace. What law? The law of animal sacrifice. Because you couldn't be forgiven for adultery under the law of animal sacrifice. Do we understand that? It said, you're not under the law, but under grace. What's grace? Good Titus 2 and 11. The book of Titus, chapter 2 and verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation have appeared unto all men. Mm -hmm. The grace of God that bringeth salvation have appeared unto all men. Teaching us that denying ungodliness. Teaching what? Teaching us that denying ungodliness. Teaching us that denying ungodliness. We should deny that thing. We should not have let sin rule or reign in our mortal bodies. Read. And worldly lust. Uh-huh. We should live soberly. We should live soberly. Read. Righteously. Righteously. Keeping God commandments. And godly. Uh-huh. In this present world. So that's what grace is to teach us. So when you read Romans 6 and 4, let's read it again since we're there. And then we'll go back. We're going to... Uh, Instead of going back to Sarai, we're going to go ahead and go back to 2 Samuel. Because we're still talking about King David's transgression. Adultery. One of them. Romans 6, 14. Yes, sir. The book of Romans, chapter 6 and verse 14. Uh -huh. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Mm -hmm. For ye are not under the law. You're not under the law of animal sacrifice. Read. But under grace. You're under grace. The opportunity to do what? Keep God's commandments. No longer do you have to be put to death for adultery, for instance. Read. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law? So that's, what it's, that's how you know not being under the law is not talking about not keeping God's commandments. It says, shall we sin, break God's commandments, transgress against the commandment of God because we're not under the law of animal sacrifice? Read. But under grace. But under grace. Read. God forbid. God forbid. Hell no. You got to keep God's commandments. It's that easy. It's that simple. Don't let a Christian fool you. I, I don't know why. We always end up on the Christian. We talking about repentance. And I guess Christians need to understand that because our people are lost in that thing. Our people are confused in Christianity. Some of our people really do have a contrite heart. They really want to get right with God, but the pastor ain't telling them how to do it. They believe in the blood of Jesus and pay your tithes. Meanwhile, you're still an adulterer. You're still a fornicator. I digress. Let's go back to 2 Samuel. Because we ain't never going to get finished. <laughs> Let's get 2 Samuel right quick, right quick, right quick. 2 Samuel chapter 11. Let me start at verse 6. Let's read verse. Because we got that part. Let's read verse 14 now. Go to 14. Yes, sir. The book of 2 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 14. Uh -huh. And it came to pass in the morning. That David wrote a letter to Joab mm -hmm. and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he, and he wrote in the letter, saying, Set ye Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle, and retire ye from him, that he may be smitten and die. Mm. So King David is commissioning Uriah to be put to death. After all this, he didn't have sex with his wife. He didn't got her pregnant. You know what? I got a plan. I got a solution. Kill him. Jump to verse 20, uh, 26. Yes, sir. Verse 26. And when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. Mm -hmm. And when the mourning was passed, David sent and fetched her to his house, and she became his wife and bare him a son. Mm hmm but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. They said the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. So what did we just read? We just read King David's transgression. This is the reason or the offset, I'd say, the inspiration for Psalms 51. Not only did King David commit adultery, he also committed murder. Let's get some scriptures on that. Let's get adultery. Exodus 20 and 14. Let's get the law. This is 2014. Let's try to read through these kind of quickly. If we can, we got time. We can get through. I think we can get through it. I think. 
Let's go ahead. Read that. The book of Exodus, chapter 20 and verse 14. Uh-huh. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Leviticus 20 and 10. It's kind of fly through these. Leviticus 20 and 10. That's the law. Thou shalt not commit adultery. You don't think King David knew that? You don't think Bathsheba knew that? Okay. Leviticus 20 and 10. Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 10. Because we know it when we out here committing adultery, especially in this truth. And the man that committeth adultery. Read it one more time. And the man that committeth adultery uh -huh. with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. So we just read that in Sirach chapter 23. You commit adultery, guess what? You're going to be put to death. That was the judgment. That is the judgment of God on those that commit that sin, right? Because God loves judgment. Isaiah 61 and 8. Let's not forget. Who we dealing with before we go too further, too much further. The book of Isaiah, chapter 61 and verse 8. What God say? For I the Lord, for I the Lord love judgment. <laughs> what God love? Love judgment. He said, I the Lord love judgment. The Lord ain't half stepping on, on judging our behind. The Lord say what he mean and mean what he say. Read it one more time. Yes, sir. For I, the Lord, love judgment. God loves judgment. So all you Christians always talk about, you can't judge me. Listen, listen I bet. We ain't going to, we'll, yeah, yeah, we don't even worry about the scripture. We, all we did was read a scripture to you. I tell you what, take that up with the Lord that loves judgment. Let us know how far that gets you. Keep reading. Yes, sir. I hate robbery of burnt offering. Mm -hmm. You hate robbery of burnt offering? Read. Sacrifice. And, and I will direct their work in truth. Uh -huh. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them. All praises to the Most High God. So let's go to Exodus 20 and 13. The God love judgment. He'll judge our behind for being adulterous. That's one of King David's transgressions. Also murder. Exodus 20 and 13. Sir. The book of Exodus chapter 20 and verse 13. Uh -huh. Thou shalt not kill. Read. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm looking at something else. Exodus 20 and 13. One more time. Yes, sir. The book of Exodus chapter 20 and verse 13. Come on. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not kill. You don't think King David knew that? Well, of course he did. But what did he do? He went against that. What do you think his judgment should have been? Genesis chapter 9 verse 6. And as we're going through these scriptures, I know we're seeing King David's example, but let's make sure we're relaying that back to ourselves, the things that we've done, the things that we may be doing. You understand? Read that. The book of Genesis chapter 9 and verse 6. Uh-huh. Whoso shed of man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. Uh-huh. For in the image of God made he man. So the judgment for murder is what? You're put to death. You kill somebody. The, the, the equal and opposite reaction of that is you being yourself put to death. We've all been in danger of the judgment, whether it be from adultery, whether it be from murder, whether it be from whatever it is, breaking God's Sabbath. We was all breaking God's Sabbath at one point. I used to be at all the, uh, the, the college football games on Saturday, breaking God's laws. Didn't know that, though, right? So how much more now knowing these things should we avoid the things that cause us to go into punishment or judgment. You understand? Adultery being one of those things. So let's go to murder being another one of those things. First John 3 and 15. Because you may think, uh, well, I didn't physically kill anyone. But what about that hatred that you have in your heart for that brother that, that labors with you? What about that hatred that you have in your heart for that sister that sits among you? Right? That sister that ha actually has your best interest at heart. She's looking after your kids and everything when you ain't around. But for some reason, you got hatred towards her. Mm. What does God call you? What position are you in with that? First John 3, 15. Yes, sir. The book of First John, chapter 3 and verse 15. Come on. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. So even when we hate each other, I ain't got to put my hands on you. But if I hate you, guess what I am? I'm a murderer. Because if I can hate you enough... What might I end up doing? I might. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? It might just get to that point. 
So we got to always examine the things that's going on in our minds. Y'all understand? Let's get Leviticus chapter 24 and verse 17. One more on the judgment for murder. Leviticus. If you hate your brother in your heart, read. Leviticus chapter 24 and verse 17. Uh-huh. And he that killeth any man shall surely be put to death. And what did it say? And he that killeth any man shall surely be put to death. That's Bible. He that killeth any man shall surely be put to death. Ain't no grace in that. You understand? And that is why we have grace now. Thank God for Jesus Christ. Thank God for, for the Most High, for him sending his son to die for our sins. Because that should have been us. All the hatred that occupies our mind. Read 24 and 17 one more time. Yes, sir. And he that killeth any man shall surely be put to death. He that killeth any man, he that hates any man, shall surely be put to death. You understand? It get real, y'all. Let's examine ourselves in these things let's go to second samuel now chapter 12 read verse one we're gonna read all the way down to verse 10 read it kind of fast for me because we're gonna read these other scriptures they just kind of there's some some things that we can kind of hit and get on and off yes sir but i do want to get this because we're talking about judgment right remember the lord loves judgment so do you think king david was judged let's see second samuel chapter 12 verse one yes sir second samuel chapter 12 and verse one and the lord sent nathan unto david and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor, the man that had exceeding many flocks and herds. But the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had brought and nourished up. And it grew up together with him and with his children. And it did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup. And lay in his bosom, and was upon him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and, and he spare, spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd, to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him. But took the poor man's lamb, and dressed it for the man that was come, un, come to him. So this is the parable, right? The, rich, the traveler came to the rich man, right? And instead of using his own flock for this man, he took from someone else. He could have used what he had to take care of this particular brother. But instead, the rich man took from someone that had less than he had. He took from a poor man. That one little ewe lamb that he had, that one thing, that he, his prized possession that he loved so much, he took that from him. Let's look at King David's reaction to this because he only he ain't right now he ain't realizing that this is a parable read and david's anger was greatly kindled against the man and he said to nathan as the lord liveth the man that have done this thing shall surely die you see that you see how ready he was quick to how quick he was to ready to put that man to death for the evil that he committed the robbery that he committed read and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. You see, they said, not only do we kill him, make him restore the lamb fourfold. But he did, King David. I don't care. Get him to, kill him and make, the, make sure the man get the lamb fourfold. You see that? You see what the, the, the instant reaction is from King David? Well, watch this. And Nathan said to David, thou art the man. What? Thou art the man. So imagine this. Nathan says all this, King David say what he thinks should have happened to that man. And then Nathan come back and say, guess what, King? You're the man. Guess what, your majesty? <laughs> you the man. You the man that took from the poor man. You are also that man that should be put to death. You got to imagine, look on King David's face when he's hearing this. He's shook. I'm sure his heart dropped when he said that. And everything begins to come to his remembrance. He's like, oh, that is me. I did have that man's wife. I did impregnate. I did take, take that man's wife. And not only did I take his life, take his wife, I took his life. Read. Yes, sir. Thus the, saith the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. I anointed thee king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. 
And I gave thee thy master's house and thy master's wives into thy bosom and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been and if that had been too little, it would more over, I would more over have given unto thee such as such, such and such, such things. things. Right. So look at everything. God is letting him know through Nathan the prophet. Look at everything that I have given you, David. I mean, out of everything that I gave you, if that wasn't enough, I would have gave you more. But that's us all the time. We ain't never satisfied with the things that the Lord has given us. We ain't never satisfied with that mean cottage. We ain't never satisfied with that job making, making just enough to take care of you and your family, making just enough to take care of you and your family and pay your arms. No, you want more. You'll break the Sabbath. You'll break God's high holy days. You'll not come to the feast days because you covetous. You want everything everybody else got. You see what's going on in the world. You see what other people got. You say, I want that too. You're never satisfied. You're insatiable. Same thing as a, uh, as a man with his wife or a, a woman with her husband. You don't want that man that you got no more. You tired of him. It ain't like you thought it was or thought it would be. So now you're looking somewhere else. Never satisfied. And God has given you the best things he could have ever given you. And would have given you more if you had but asked and kept God's commandments. Instead of choosing to sin. Sin ain't never the solution, y'all. I'm going to just go ahead and put that out there. Sin is never the solution, especially when it comes down to our problems. Things that we got going on in our mind. Just something to, just something to think about. Right? Verse 9. Yes, sir. Verse 9. Wherefore hast thou dis despised the commandment of the Lord? So why did you despise the commandment of the Lord? To do evil in his sight. Uh-huh. Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. Thou hast killed Uriah with the sword. And hast taken his wife to be thy wife. And taken his wife to be thy wife. And hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. And you somebody else, you put a hit out on him. You slayed, slayed him with the sword of the children of Ammon, the other nations. Think about how evil that is. Knowing God has no dealings with the other nations. Knowing how God feel about the other nations putting his hands, putting their hands on the apple of God's eye, which is the Israelites. And you still commission to have that done. Sin was reigning over King David at the point. At that point. He was gone. He was gone with the wind. It was over with. Satan was, I'm talking, Satan was on his back at that point in time. And now it takes another brother, a prophet, to come out and show him that. Open that understanding to him. Read. Now, Read therefore, yes, sir. now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from thine house. So what? The judgment. It says, now, therefore, shall the sword never depart from thine house. Read. Because thou hast despised me. And has taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. So the sword will never depart from King David's house. It's always going to be war. It's always going to be turmoil in his life, in the lives of his children. As you read on, you actually see that. Let's keep going just a little bit because there's some more to it. Verse 11. Yes, sir. Thus saith the Lord, behold, I will, I will raise up evil against thee out of thine own house. Uh-huh. And I, will, and I will take thy wives before thine eyes uh -huh. and give them unto thy neighbor. Give them. He's going to give his wives unto his, unto his neighbor. That neighbor actually ends up being his own son. Read. And he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of, of this son. And he shall lie with his wives in the sight of this son. And, the whole, and everybody see it. Everybody that was in view could see it. Read. This is the fall. This is the ruin of King David's household. Just like we talked about in Ezekiel 18, we got to repent. So ruin does not come to us. Ruin being one, the things that go through go, that we go through in this life because of our sin, the consequences or the judgments for those actions, and ultimately us not getting the kingdom. Read. For thou didst it secretly. How you do it? Secretly. Thou didst it secretly. Read. But I will do the do this thing before all Israel. And before the sun. That's what the Lord do. We think we do. We run around thinking we're doing stuff secretly, right? We think we hiding things from the Lord. You not hiding. And the Lord is letting us know. You do it in secret. I'm bringing it all to like everybody going to know what's going on. Everybody going to know what's wrong with you. Everybody going to know the situation. Because you tried to hide it. You tried to hide it from the one somebody that can see everything that you're doing. You wasn't worried about the eyesight of God. You was more worried about me and not seeing you. Imagine that. You're not worried about God seeing you and men 
actually end up seeing you. Catch you in that? You think you hide? You might, you think you hide? You think you go to this city or that city? You going on dates? You going out sitting down having conversations with uh with sisters? Ain't no telling what else you doing. And you ain't worried about God seeing you. And guess what? Turn around, your own brother see you. Ain't that some? Read that one more time, man. Yes, sir. For thou didst it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. That's how our God rolled. He loved judgment. But this is the part I wanted to get to. Verse 13. Yes, sir. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, the Lord also have put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. What's that an example of? We just read all them scriptures prior to this about the judgment for or what should have been the judgment for King David in terms of adultery, in terms of murder. What did that, what that verse say? Read verse 13 one more time. Yes, sir. And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, the Lord also have put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. He said, the Lord also have put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. That, an example, that is an example, brothers and sisters, of the grace that God has given us. Titus 3 and 3. That's what we got to see in King David's example, right? His acknowledging of the fact that he sinned, because he said it. He said, and David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And we're going to go back to Psalms 51. We're going to read a few more verses in that chapter. Right. And we're going to talk about what can help us get to that starting point, the starting phase of repentance. Right. And it's a few things. Just three. Just three that we going to go and examine today. But let's go to. Yeah. Read that. Titus three and three. Yes, sir. The book of Titus, chapter three and verse three. Because this is us, y'all. This is us. This was us. We've all been in a position of where we could have been put to death. And the Lord says, you know what? I'm going to put away your sin. You shall not die. Read that. Yes, sir. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, lying in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. All those things. That's it on that? Yes, sir. That's all of that. That was us. Everything that we was chasing after in the world, all the, the evil that we was doing, all the hating on each other that we was doing. Right? We all did that. We all were worthy to die the death. But the Lord says, you know what? I'm not going to put you to death. I'm going to give you grace. I'm going to send my son to die for you. I'm going to give you an opportunity to repent. Let's go to Psalms 51. Psalms 51 and verse 2. The book of Psalms, chapter 51 and verse 2. Uh -huh. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. So you see what King David says? See what the prayer is? He says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Go to John 15 and 3. How do we wash ourselves? How do we cleanse ourselves in the eyesight of God? John 15 3. The book of John, chapter 15 and verse 3. 3. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. How are we clean? Through the word which I have spoken unto you. So we clean ourselves up. We wash ourselves thoroughly with the word of God. We see where committing adultery is evil. Well, guess what? We, we see. We start doing. We start to recognize and acknowledge the fact that we shouldn't be doing that anymore. If you was doing that before you came into the truth, if you was doing fornication, all these different things, right? Real repentance is turning away from those sins. We wash ourselves through the word of God. Psalms 119 and 9. The book of Psalms, chapter 119 and verse 9. Uh -huh. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? Read. By taking heed thereto according to thy word. So how do we cleanse our ways? We do by, that. By what? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. By taking heed to God's commandments. We got to be able to use God's words to catch ourselves. Keep us from falling. And if we just so happen to fall, use God's words to pick us back up. Cleanse ourselves. Wash the dirt off. You understand that? Go to First Peter chapter 3. Because it's God's words that we use. 
to cleanse ourselves. Watch this, 1 Peter 3, 21. Yes, sir. The book of 1 Peter, chapter 3 and verse 21. <clears throat> The like figure, whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. It said the like figure, the similitude, whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Read. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. Not simply washing your body. Read. But the answer of a good conscience toward God. But the answer, the answer of a good conscience, a good mind, mind frame, the change of behavior. Towards God, read. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what we're clean from. Now we're able to be clean through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Through Christ coming and dying for us. Laying down his life for us. And now that opportunity to repent is being open to us. So guess what we now have to do? Cleanse ourselves with the word of God and change our minds. Have a good conscience toward the Lord. Go back to Psalms 51. Let's read verse 3. The book of Psalms. I'm not going to do the whole chapter, but yeah. Go to Psalms 51, uh, yes, verse 3. Yes, sir. The book of Psalms, chapter 51, and verse 3. Uh huh. For I acknowledge my transgressions. What do you say? For I acknowledge my transgressions. He said, I acknowledge my transgressions. So let's talk about that for a minute. What is that called? That's called taking accountability. Uh, what I've seen so far in my short time being in this truth is that repentance usually starts with three things. Taking accountability for your actions, uh, forming healthier habits, and fear. Yes, that's what we're about to talk about for a second. Accountability, better habits, fear. Let's talk about accountability because that's what K King David just said. He said, I acknowledge my transgressions. That's what we got to start at. We have to acknowledge that we're wrong. And a lot of times as people, that's the hardest thing for us to do. Go to that, uh, that first article I sent y'all. I just want a quick point out of that. Yeah, the difficulty and necessity of accountability. The difficulty and necessity of accountability. All right, scroll down. Because accountability is a difficult thing for us to do. And it's um, also nece ne necessary, I should say, that we should do these things, right? I want to see, I want to get to a certain point. Uh, matter of fact, Let's read this right here. Let's read why is accountability so important and stressful? Why is accountability so important and stressful? Accountability often falls into the same category as conflict and feedback. Mm -hmm. Most of us don't like getting or giving it, but it's necessary. So accountability often falls into the same category as conflict and feedback. A lot of us hate that thing. We don't want no conflict. We don't want no feedback. For our actions and usually we know what we're doing is kind of jacked up that's why we don't want to hear nobody say nothing about it but there's several reasons as to why we go into those the different mind frames that we have about choosing to shy away from accountability sometimes we just don't think we can be wrong and there's other reasons as well keep going so why is accountability so hard for a lot of us we put stress and pressure on ourselves when we make a commitment and say we're going to do something we don't want to mess up, disappoint people, or break our word. And that's what we oftentimes do, and we attempt to hide. Once we've messed up, we try to hide from what's coming, the conflict that's going to come after that. Read. Accountability can be challenging because many of us have to pass trauma from it. Uh -huh. it, might be, it might be filled with shame or judgment, and that's a big reason why many people shy away from it. Remember what we just read in Isaiah 61? It said the Lord loved judgment. We're attempting to, what we do when we avoid accountability, we're attempting to run away from the judgment that may come with that. But what is that supposed to cause? What is that? So what is this taking accountability? What should that do for us? That's what we got to get into the mindset of realizing. If I take accountability for my actions, although what comes after this, may I may perceive as negative as far as the conflict or the feedback I get from it, What's the main goal of taking accountability? Scroll down. There's a certain part I want to get to. Slow down for me. Let's see. Go back up. Go back up. Go back up. Go up one more time. There we go. However, read that part. Yes, sir. However, 
accountability is necessary for so many aspects of, of life growth. We have to realize that accountability is necessary for several aspects in our lives, like growth. What else? Relationships. Uh huh. Success. And business. Growth, relationships, success, and business. Change. Positive change. That is what accountability is designed to create. But because we're so scared of the conflict, the shame, the judgment that may come with it, we'll never get to those points, that cleansing of ourselves. That's the same thing it's talking about right there. Read. Without it, it's difficult for us to get things done or push ourselves past our perceived limits. Y'all see that? It say without accountability is difficult for us to get things done and go and push ourselves past our perceived limits. Y'all understand that? That's what happens to us. When we don't want to take accountability, we'll never break the mold. We'll never go beyond that threshold. We'll never grow. So we got to take accountability. That's what King David's doing right here in Psalms 51. Read Psalms 51 and 3 one more time. Yes, sir. Because Psalms chapter 51 and verse 3. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee Stop right there. I'm sorry. Say, I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Go to Baruch chapter 2, verse 30. The book of Baruch chapter 2 and verse 30. Mm hmm for I knew that they would not hear me because it is a stiff necked people. But in the land of their captivities, uh -huh. they shall remember themselves. That we going to do what? Where? Read one more time. Yes, sir. For I knew that they would not hear me because it is a stiff necked people. But in the land of their captivities, they shall remember themselves. In the land of our captivity, guess what we're going to do? We're going to remember ourselves. Another scripture says we're going to bethink ourselves. And what are we going to do? We're going to take accountability. We're going to realize that, oh, wow, I did mess up. I am the reason I'm in the position that I am in now. We have to. It's imperative. It's the only way that we're going to change. Keep reading that verse, that next verse, 31. Yes, sir. And shall know that I am the Lord their God, for I will give them in heart and ears to hear. Right there. Go to uh, Jeremiah 6, 16. Remember, remember. Let's look at that word. We got to remember. When we take accountability, that's, guess what happens? The light switch cut on. It's the same thing we've seen when after the, Nathan explained the parable to King David and saying that you that rich, you that man that deserves to die. King David's immediate response was, oh, man, I have sinned against the Lord, my God. He caught himself. He's able to see it. He remembers now. So in that mind frame, us remembering ourselves, what should we do? Jeremiah 6, 16. Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16. Uh -huh. Thus said the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths, uh -huh. whether it is the good way and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But right they there, I'm sorry. It said, thus saith the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths, the old paths, the, the old things, the law of God. Remember. Remember the things that are written. Remember those things that God gave us to help us through this life. Those things that he said was good for us. His commandments. Come on. Where, in, where is? Yes, sir. Where, Where is, is the good way? Okay. And walk therein. And walk therein. That's a part of that remembrance. Remember who we are. We remember our God's commandments and we walk in those things. And what will happen? And ye, and ye shall find rest for your soul. And we shall find rest for your soul. Think about all the stress you go through on a day to day trying to hide your sin. Remember, think about all the anxiety that you go through trying to hold on or put these things to the side and never really casting them away from you, never really doing away with the sin, trying to put a mask on. You understand? God said, all you got to do is remember yourself, remember where you messed up, remember the commandments, walk therein, and you'll have rest to your soul. Read. But they said, we will not walk therein. But that's oftentimes our problem. We don't want to take the accountability. We will never do that first part, verse 16. Until we realize that it's our fault. You got to be able to say that to yourself. Yep, it's my fault. I messed up. I did that. I got to fix that. I got to fix this about myself. I got to fix this with God. 
I got to fix this with anybody around me that may be neg may have been negatively affected. And that's if I can, because certain sins destroy a whole lot of stuff. Like I said, adultery will destroy whole households. Now I got to be divorced in the house. Now if it's children involved, they can't come back to the school no more. Who them kids hanging around? Because a lot of our kids are homeschooled and things of that nature. So they friends is here in the body. And now you committing adultery, they can't come back. And I look at you, look, what have you done to them? Look, what have you done to the psyche, the mind frame of those children? You understand how far down the rabbit hole we fall when we go into things like adultery and any other sin that, that can be. We got to remember the old past, y'all. Let's go to John 14, 26. Talking about remembrance still. This is what happens when we take accountability. The book of John, chapter 14 and verse 26. So remember that last scripture said, remember the old paths wherein is the good way. Well, what, how, how do we attain that? How do we get to that point? John 14, 26. Yes, sir. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. When we, re when we take accountability, the Lord sends us the comforter, read, which is the Holy Ghost. Come on. Because we all need comfort. Even after, even when we acknowledge the things that we've done, guess what? You're going to need some comfort because it hurt, y'all. It, it hurt to fall. It hurts to fall. So what do we need at that point? We need comfort, right? Read. Whom the Father will send in my name. Uh -huh. He shall teach you all things. And do what? And bring all things to your remembrance. And bring all things to your remembrance. Come on. Whatsoever I have said unto you. That's it. That's those old paths. When we acknowledge our offense, guess what? All things will come to our remembrance. We'll have, we'll get the blueprint to get our lives back on track, to get ourselves walking this straight and narrow with God. You understand? To actually repent, be sorrowful and repent. Go to Revelation 2 and 5. The book of Revelations, chapter 2 and verse 5. Mm-hmm. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. So remember from where we've fallen. Read. And repent. And do what? And repent. And repent. Come on. And do the first works. Do the first works. We got to go back to the first works, y'all. We got to go back to the old paths. We got to get back to the love of our life, which is these commandments. If we really want to put ourselves in a space to actually repent. Come on. Or else. Or else. I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place except thou repent so the lord said he will remove our candlestick out of his place except we repent if we keep on going on in our sin dealing with it, dealing with it playing with it pretending like we sorry and still going back to it the lord said he'll remove our candlestick out of his place what's that mean second Ezra chapter 14 verse 25 yeah 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 second Ezra 14 verse 25 what is the candlestick Watch this. The book of Second Ezra, chapter 14 and verse 25. Uh -huh. And come hither, and I shall light a candle under, of understanding. A candle of what? I shall light a candle of understanding. A candle of understanding. In thine heart. In your mind, read. Which shall not be put out till the things be performed which thou shalt begin to write. So what's the candlestick? The candlestick is the candlestick of your understanding. So what does God mean when he said, go back to Revelation 2 and 5? If we don't repent, he'll blow out our candlestick. The book of Revelations, chapter 2 and verse 5. Uh -huh. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else uh -huh. I will come unto thee quickly, and, do and, what? and will remove thy candlestick out of his place. Except thou repent. So unless we repent, we will put ourselves in the position to where God will remove our candlestick. He will take our understanding. Remember, the scriptures say, go to Proverbs 6.32 real quick. This just jumped in my mind. Declare what even supposed to be about adultery, so to speak, or just alone. But we got to talk about it, especially with that being one of King David's sins, right? Because remember, it says that if we don't repent, then guess what? The Lord remove our candlestick, our understanding. Well, watch this. Proverbs 6, 32. The book of Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 32. Uh -huh. But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. You commit adultery, you lack what? Lacketh understanding. That's how you get to that point. Because God has now blown out your understanding.
you confused. You don't even care no more. The reason why you're committing adultery, why? Because you have not repented. You've been watching porn. You've been texting that sister, texting this brother, secret phone calls late at night, secret rendezvous and whatnot, thinking ain't nobody seeing you. Guess what? Most high just going. And now what happens? Reverse 32. But whosoever committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. Mm -hmm. He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. You do that, you destroy your own soul. You bring yourself to ruin. Why? Because you lack understanding. Understanding gone at that point. You could be a high-ranking uh, officer. Understanding gone because you want to get your rocks off. Most high just see how that worked for you. That could even go as so far as you even you forget you'll just give up on the truth. You're like, you know what? I like white women. It is what it is. We ain't the Israelites no more. Understanding. Gone. Let's go back to Psalms 51. It's 51 and 4. We are definitely not going to do this whole chapter. <laughs> but we're getting into it. Psalms 51 and 4. Yes, sir. The book of Psalms, chapter 51 and verse 4. Uh huh. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned. So against thee, thee only have I sinned. We got to understand that. We sinned against God. Read. And done this evil in thy sight. And done this evil in God's sight, read. That thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. And that, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Guess what? We do it to ourselves, y'all. God is completely justified in whatever he decides to bring upon us for our evil. You understand that? Let's go to, let's go to Daniel chapter 9. Nah, we got it. Hmm. I tell you what. Daniel chapter 9. Let's, Daniel chapter 9, verse 11. Then we're going to read another scripture after that. Then we're going to have to jump. The Daniel 9 and 11. How God justified in that thing. Watch this. The book of Daniel chapter 9 and verse 11. Come on. Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law. All Israel transgressed God's commandments. All the Israelites, all 12 tribes. Even by departing. Uh-huh. That they might not obey thy voice. Therefore, the curse is poured upon us. And the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him mm -hmm. and have and have confirmed his words. He what? And have confirmed his words. He confirmed his words. He told us what would happen if we broke his commandments. That's the thing about it. That's why God is clear. He's precise. And when he executes judgment, he fully justified in that thing because he told us. Hey, you can get blessed. You will get blessed if you keep my commandments. You will get cursed, however, if you don't. Read. Which he spake against us and against our judges that judged us by bringing upon us a great evil. For under the whole heaven have not been done as have been done unto Jerusalem. So right there. That's it. That's all I needed. That's really what I needed right there. So let's go back. Let's go to now. Now let's go, not go back. Jeremiah 25. <laughs> Five. I'm sorry. We got to get it, y'all. We got to bring this out. The book, of Jer the book of Jeremiah, chapter 25 and verse 5. Mm -hmm. They said, turn ye again now, every one from his evil way and from the evil of your doings and dwell in the land that the Lord hath given unto you. So we got to turn away from our evil ways. That's repentance. Read. And to your fathers forever and ever. Uh -huh. And go not after other gods to serve them. And to worship them and provoke me not to anger with the works of your hands. And I will do you no hurt. God says he won't do us any hurt if we return unto him. Right. We let go of the things that are causing us to fall away. The idols. And yes, fornication is an idol. Evil concupiscence is a. You know what I want. <laughs> Read that for Colossians. God said we got to turn away from these things. The book of Colossians chapter you know, 3 and verse 5. Yeah. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection. Mortify dead in those members. Read. Evil concupiscence. Evil sexual desires. And, co and covetousness. And covetousness. Some of the things that we've seen King David deal with. Some of the things that we deal with. Read. Which is idolatry. It's idolatry. Now go back to Jeremiah 25 and 6. We just got to get the point. That's all. Jeremiah 25 and verse 6. What God says? Because all those things, covetousness especially, is idolatry. 
You will serve that thing. You allow it to reign over you. That's how it's idolatry. That now, your sin, your flesh now becomes your God. Read verse 6 again, Jeremiah 25. Yes, sir. The book of Jeremiah chapter 25 and verse 6. Uh-huh. And go not after other gods to serve them and to worship them and provoke me not to anger with the works of your hands. And I will do you no hurt. See that? God says, turn from your idols. That could have been a Buddha statue. That could have been that Buddha you was looking at on that porn website. Eat all. God said, turn away from that thing. Read. And he won't do you no hurt. Come on. Yet ye have not hearkened unto me, saith the Lord, that ye might provoke me to anger with the works of your hands, to your own hurt. To whose hurt? To your own hurt. That's what we got to realize, y'all. You're hurting yourself. When it come, we are hurting ourselves, y'all. When it comes down to our sin, that's why we got to repent. That stress, that anxiety, all that, that you go through on a day-to-day -day basis trying to cover that up, you doing that to you. And then once it's eventually found out that domino effect of everything that happens afterwards, who can be blamed for that? It's us. We did it to ourselves. We can blame whoever we want to. We can blame it on all these external factors. Well, he did this. She said this. I went through this. This happened when I was seven years old. That don't matter. You break God's commandments because it's an act of choice to do so. And that's why we got to get to this next part. The next thing that repentance come, that comes with repentance or offsets repentance is changing our habits, changing what we, would do, what we do, changing our behavior. We've already taken accountability now. Now what do we do next? We got to change the things about ourselves that made us who we were and change into things that will make us who we should be in, in Christ. In the spirit of the Most High. Get Psalms 55 and verse 19 for me. And then we're going to read Psalms 51. Go back to Psalm 51. Fifty-five and nineteen. Yes, sir. The book of Psalms, chapter fifty-five and verse nineteen. Watch this. God shall heal and afflict them, even he that abideth of old. God shall hear and afflict them, even he that abideth of old. Read. Say la. Why? Because they have not they have no changes. Therefore, they fear not God. You see that? The reason why we go through the affliction that we go through is because we don't change. So how do we fix that? How do we change that? Obviously, it means we got to change. Go to Psalms 51, 51 and 5 this time. Yes, sir. Psalms chapter 51 and verse 5. Behold, I was sharpened in iniquity. I was shaping. My bad. Behold, I was shaping in iniquity. Uh-huh. And in sin did my mother conceive me. Meaning what? In this sinful flesh. That's what we all working, walking around in, right? That is that thing that is weakening our spirit. I can't just have go. I, I can't just hold on to it. So, uh, Wisdom of Solomon nine and fifteen. I can't just say it. Shaping in iniquity, right? What is that? That's going into our flesh. Wisdom of Solomon nine and fifteen. Yes, sir. The book of Wisdom of Solomon, chapter nine and verse fifteen. Mm -hmm. For the corruptible body presses down the soul. It's the corruptible body, that flesh, that presses down the soul. That's us being shaping in iniquity. We born into what? This flesh. Read. And the earthly tabernacle weighs down the mind that muses upon many things. And the earthly tabernacle, that earthly body, that earthly temple weighs down the, the mind that muses upon many things. Your mind muses upon many things. Why? Because you're in sin. And you have yet to acknowledge the fact. We have yet to acknowledge the fact. You understand? So that is, go back, Psalm 51 and 5 one more time. The book of Psalms, chapter 51 and verse 5. Mm -hmm. Behold, I was shaping in iniquity. Shaping in iniquity. And in, and in sin did my mother conceive me. In the flesh, that sinful flesh that weigheth down the spirit, the, re the, the, the true man of the heart, the righteousness, that righteous spirit within you. It's your flesh that weighs that down. And oftentimes what we do, we continue to feed that flesh as opposed to feed that spirit. Come on. Behold. My bad. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. You see that? It said God desires truth in the inward parts, the hidden parts. Go to, uh, why? Go to uh, Jeremiah 17, 9. Jeremiah 17, 9. Read. It's all going to us changing our behavior, right? 
The yeah. heart is deceitful above many things, above all things, uh -huh. and desperately wicked. Read. Who can know it? You see that? It said the heart is desperately wicked. Our mind desperately wicked, y'all. That's why it's important, imperative for us to change our thought process. That's what's going to allow us to change our behavior. Keep going. I, the Lord, searches the heart. Mm -hmm. I try the reins. Uh-huh. Even to give every man according to his ways. You see that? That's why it's so important for truth to be in our inward parts. A lot of times we put on a representative, but that ain't really who we are. That ain't really who we trying to be. We what we being what we want you to see. We want the people around us to see. But what about what God see? We've taken that all out. Of, we ain't even think about that no more. Knowing, not even realizing rather. That God is the one that tries our our reigns. The only one that's knowing, the only person that knows what's going on within you is you and the most high God. You cannot hide it. That's why he desires truth in the inward parts. And that truth in the inward parts should begin to display on the outside. Let's get uh, that second article I sent y'all. I just want a few quick points from that. A guide to breaking. Yeah, read that. Yes, sir. A guide to breaking bad habits and improving your quality of life. So a guide to breaking bad habits and improving your quality of life. So changing, changing, y'all, that's what improves our quality of life. That's what God is requiring us to do, to change, to repent. That's what repentance is. Let's scroll down. Let's just get a few quick points. I ain't trying to do a lot of read. We still got a bunch of scriptures. We don't have to cut a lot of that, too. Let's read that first bold point. Yes, sir. Habits. Habits. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Habits are a part of our daily lives. Be it procrastination. Procrastination. We deal with that. Snacking. Mm, snacking. We deal with that. Or smoking. Smoking. Yep. I'm sure. Yep. People in the body still smoking. We all have habits that we need to break. We all have habits that we need to break. Keep going. However, Breaking bad habits is easier said than done. It requires a major amount of effort and willpower. The good news is that with the right mindset, we can break bad habits and create new ones that support our future growth. You see that? That's what we have to do, y'all. With the right mindset, we can change everything it is about us. We can change that output. We can change those behaviors. But it starts with what? Our mind. Get Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 23. Watch this. Ephesians 4 and verse 23. Start at verse 22. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 22. That ye put off concerning the former conversation, the old man. So these are actionable steps to changing our mind. St change what you talk about. Come on. Which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Uh-huh. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So simply changing what we talk about. Instead of gossiping all the time, start talking about the scriptures. Instead of talking about sports and uh, rappers all the time in the world, start talking about the scriptures. Talk about righteous music. So on and so forth. Simply changing your conversation can do what? Read verse 23. Yes, sir. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. It can change your mind. But it's a, it's a, it's a two-way street. In order to even get to that point, you got to change your mind. And what you do over time, you build better habits. And what happens? You're what? Reverse 23 one more time. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You're then renewed in the spirit of your mind. That's the way it works. You have to change your mind, be disciplined in your mind frame and your mindset. Have a goal or a growth mindset and then change your behavior. That's how it works. That's what God is calling us to in this truth. Real repentance, real change. Not just saying it, but doing it. Go to Psalms 51. Let's read verse 7. The book of Psalms chapter 51 and verse 7. Uh-huh. Purge me with hyssop. So this is what we want. This should be our prayer for God to purge us. Read. And I shall be clean. We talked about what makes us clean. It's the word of God that washes us. You understand? Read it. Matter of fact, go to uh, Isaiah 1. And then we'll jump back to this. Isaiah 1, 16. 
The book of Isaiah, chapter 1 and verse 16. Uh-huh. Wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. You see that? It says cease to do, cease to do, cease to do. That's an action word. Cease to do evil. And what will happen? We'll be washed and made clean before the Lord our God. Read verse 17. So once we learn, so once we cease to do evil, what should be the next steps? Change the behavior. Read. Learn to do well. D do what? Learn to do well. Learn to do well. You can't just wake up one morning and say you've changed. You don't just go to sleep one night, an adulterer, and wake up uh, just righteous. You ain't an adulterer no more. It don't work like that. You don't just go to sleep a liar, and you just wake up not lying. Matter of fact, you go to sleep a liar, the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning, lie. What you got to do? Reverse 17 one more time. Learn to do well. You have to learn to do well. You have to change that mindset. Change that mind. Change the cognitive. You understand? And what happens? We learn to do well. Our mind changes, then our actions follow. Read. Seek judgment. Uh huh. Seek judgment. Whereas you was running from judgment, running away from taking accountability, guess what you got to do? Read it. Seek judgment. Seek judgment. Come on. Relieve the oppressed. And guess what you begin to learn how to do? You learn how to relieve the oppressed. You then become that, that, uh, savior you for you brothers out there for you men out there for you leaders out there when we get to this point then we can what relieve the oppressed those that's going through whatever they're going through in this life we got to deal with our own stuff first read judge the fatherless plead for the widow all praises to the most high god so go back to psalms 51 just wanted to show an example of purging we're purging the evil how do we do that we cease to do evil and we learn to do well that's what God wants us to do. Psalms 51, verse 7, one more time. It's Psalms 51 and verse 7. Uh -huh. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Because mm. that's the point that we've gotten to. What they say, read the, what that last part about the bones, read that one more time. Yes, sir. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. That the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Sometimes for a lot of us, it takes that in us. It takes for God to literally break us down for us to repent. Read Hosea 5 and 15. Show you what I mean. Hosea 5 and 15. The book of Hosea chapter 5 and verse 15. I will go and return to my place mm -hmm. till they acknowledge their offense. Till they acknowledge, till we acknowledge our offense. You wonder where God at? He's waiting for you to acknowledge your offense. Read. Take accountability. Come on. And seek my face. Uh-huh. In their affliction, they will seek me early. They say, in our affliction, God understands that. In our affliction, we will seek him early. For some of us, that's light affliction. But for some of us, God got to break our bones like King David just said. So we got to take that into accountability. We got to be full aware of what's going on with us. You understand? Keep reading. Chapter 6, verse 1. Come and let us return unto the Lord. Uh-huh. For he have torn. He have what? He have torn. He have torn. Read. And he will heal us. But he's going to heal us. Come on. He have smitten. He have smitten. He broke us down. He broke our bones. But what? And he will bind us up. But he will bind us up. What's, what, anything else on that? No, sir. All praise. Let's go back to Psalms 51, reverse 9. We almost done. Yes, sir. The book of Psalms, chapter 51 and verse 9. Mm -hmm. Hide thy face from my sins. Hide thy face from my sins. Come on. And blot out all mine iniquities. So that's what we want from the Lord, right? Read. Create in me a clean heart, uh -huh. O God, a renew. Hey, and read that one more time. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew. And renew. A right spirit within me. A renew a right spirit within me. That's the same thing we read in Ephesians chapter 4. That's what we want from God. We want to be renewed in the spirit. You understand? Let's allow guys. Oh, let's take accountability. Let's change our actions and let the Lord work. Let the, Lord, the word of the Lord work within us. So we don't get to this point. Because it's the last point. Right? Repentance usually starts with taking accountability. Changing habits. But the last and most important of the two, or the three rather, is fear. That's the point we got to get to. 
Because fear really is what starts the other ones. We got to learn how to have a, 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 a fear for our God that we've never had before. Let's, uh, let's, let, let's take a look at fear right quick. Play that video, that last video, that short. I just like this one. I'm gonna let, 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 let a mighty man himself tell you. Hold on, before you play it, before you play it, that's the bishop, that's the general right there. Read Psalm 51 to 11. This will be the last one from Psalm 51 that we read. Then we're going to fly through some scriptures after this yes, about sir. fear. Because this is the point we don't want to get to. Yes, sir. Psalm chapter 51 and verse 11. Uh -huh. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Where might you end up if that happens? Let's play that. Let's let the general tell you. And whichever one of you niggas in the military is guilty will burst in a burst of fire. <laughs> Thou shall not lie down with mankind as you lie down with a nigga and your ass burst in the fire. <laughs> Thou shall not steal and your ass burst in the fire. Read it again, read it again, read it again. And shall lay before them their evil thoughts and the torments wherewith they shall begin to be tormented, which are like unto a flame. And he shall destroy them without labor by the law, which is like unto fire. You see that God's law is like unto fire. He gonna speak the laws and people gonna die. You heard what the bishop said? It's gonna be like fire from your behind. Them same laws that you neglected to keep while you was alive, the same way that you didn't want to change your behavior, the same words you didn't want to change your mind behind, guess what? It's going to be fire on your behind with those same words. Fiery indignation. We got to come to a level of fear. We got to understand that this is going to happen. I know he said Negroes in the military based upon the scripture that he was reading, but guess what? That's for all of us if we don't repent. Give me Hebrews eleven twenty six. Let's get to it. Just a few more scriptures. Hebrews eleven twenty six. It's a Hebrews chapter 10. 10, 26. Let's and go. verse 26. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. Well, if we sin willfully, ain't no more sacrifice. There's, no more, there's nothing else that we can do to save us from what's coming to us. Read that verse 27. But a certain fearful looking for of the for of judgment uh -huh. and fiery indignation. What type of indignation? Fiery indignation. Fiery indignation. Flames, read. Which shall devour the adversaries. Go to uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 23. I need you to hit these. Let's go. We're going to go quick. Romans 6, 23. Fiery indignation. What is that? Romans chapter 6. And verse 23. Uh-huh. For the wages of sin is death. Uh-huh. But the gift of God is eternal life. They say the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. If the gift is eternal life. What you think the death is there? Because everybody die. Go to John chapter 5, verse 29. If the gift is eternal life, what do we really think that death is? Is that you get hit by a car? Is that you eat the wrong thing and die of food poisoning? Let's find out. John 5, 29. It's yes, John chapter 5 and verse 29. And shall, and shall come forth they that have done good uh -huh. unto the resurrection of life. They that have done good to the resurrection of life, eternal life, that gift, read. And they that have done evil. They that have done evil, you just decide, you know what? I ain't going to repent. The hell with it. What God say? Unto the resurrection of damnation. The resurrection of damnation. What is that? Revelation 22 and 7. Because we got to get our minds to this point. That fear, we got to have that. Come on. Revelation, Revelation 21 and verse 7. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. Uh-huh. And I will be his God, uh -huh. and he shall be my son. So if we overcome in this life, guess what? We'll inherit all things. We'll get that gift of eternal life, right, Reed? But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable. The fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, Reed. And murderers. And murderers. And whoremongers. Uh-huh. And sorcerers. And sorcerers. And idolaters. Idolaters. And all liars. Read. Shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That's the death. That's the wages of sin. You understand? That's the point that we don't want to get to. So how do we fix it? Two more scriptures. 
Sirach 19 and 18. The book of Sirach, chapter 19 and verse 18. Uh-huh. The fear of the Lord is the first step. They said the fear of the Lord is the first step. To be accepted of him. Uh-huh. And wisdom obtaineth his love. So that's what we want. That's what we got to get to. That fear is the first step that we should take. That's why fear comes first, and then we take accountability. Then we change our behavior because we know what the end all be all will be if we do not. We got to repent, y'all. Last scripture, Acts 3 and 19. Beautiful thing about being an Israelite, that guess what? Repentance is for you. Matter of fact, before you read that, Acts 5, 31, I'm sorry. I got to read it. Acts 5, 31, then Acts 3, 19, we done. The book of Acts, chapter 5 and verse 31. Read that. Him have God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. You see that? That's the whole point, y'all. That's what is for us. Repentance is laid up for us, the Israelites in Christ. That forgiveness of sins. So why not take advantage? Acts 3, 19, we done. So the book of Acts, chapter 3 and verse 19. Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So that's it. We got to repent and be converted, y'all. So I pray we glean something from this class. Let's take heed. Lord, will life last. We'll see each other on the next go around. Officers right here, Jackson, Mississippi. We're going to say shalom. Most high in Christ, bless. What is the nation? Nation is family. Nation is community. Nation is men leading by example. Nation is women's support 